Mr. Speaker, let me start by acknowledging God Almighty and thank him for having kept me for the last 15 and a half years that I've been in this honorable house. And it is with a deep sense of gratitude and honor that I come to this honorable house as a Minister of Labor and Social Security. To the Prime Minister, the most honorable Andrew Holness, I say thank you for the confidence you have reposed in me and in appointing me the Minister of Labor and Social Security. I view this assignment as a very important one, given the critical role the ministry must play in the transformation of the Jamaican economy and the quest for economic growth and prosperity. With this in mind, I am fully committed to the task and ideals of the government in achieving the mandate given to us by the people of Jamaica. Mr. Speaker, allow me to publicly say thanks to my family who have supported me in all my efforts. I extend special thanks to my wonderful and valued constituents of St. Anne Northeast, and without whose support I would not be here today, and I promise wholeheartedly that I will put my best foot forward as Member of Parliament in service to them. I want to act... I want to acknowledge the contribution and the support that my constituency secretary, Ms. Geraldine Mignot, has given me over the last 15 and a half years. She has been a tower of strength. I want to acknowledge my management team and the members of the executive of Centre and Northeast. Mr. Speaker, I must also acknowledge all the former ministers who have worked in this very challenging ministry. I want to put on record my respect and my acknowledgement for all the men and women who worked before me in this ministry. <laughs> to my colleagues on both sides who have shown me much love and respect, I say thank you, and I look forward to a continued good working relationship with all of them. And it would be remiss of me, Mr. Speaker, not to congratulate you on your new post as Speaker of this Honorable House. Congratulations, sir. And Mr. Speaker, I want to also express my gratitude to the dedicated group of public servants at the Ministry of Labor and Social Security who are ably led by the Permanent Secretary, Mrs. Collett Roberts Risden. Commendations are also in order to our tripartite partners, employers, and trade unions, the various government departments, and our external stakeholders for their continued support to the process of shaping policies and programs to benefit Jamaica. Mr. Speaker, permit me to use this occasion to acknowledge the invaluable contribution of stalwarts in the labor movement who have recently passed on. And I speak of Lloyd Goodley, Clive Dobson, Hopeton Cavan, Alvin Sinclair, and Roosevelt Walker. And I just wish to assure this honorable house that we will continue on the tremendous legacy that they have left. Mr. Speaker, today I intend to outline the initiatives within the ministry that are critical and which will contribute to the administration's goal of economic growth and prosperity under the theme, Advancing Prosperity Through Labor and Social Protection. But before I proceed, I wish to lay on the table of the House three documents in the form of the Ministry's 2015-2016 Annual Performance Report and Statistical Bulletin, a research study, and, and a research study entitled Employment in the Renewable Energy, a focus on solar and wind energy, and a research paper entitled Potential Areas of Employment Opportunities Due to Logistics Hub Development. Mr. Speaker, I wish to highlight the diligence and conscientiousness of the dedicated team at the Ministry in ensuring that our annual reporting obligations to Parliament are fulfilled on time each year. I want to also highlight our commitment to transparency and good governance as we seek to provide information on the Ministry's varied programs, services, and initiatives. I begin with the observation from the highly respected Labor Market Reform Commission 
that there is an urgent need to reposition the Ministry of Labor and Social Security as an economic ministry and the need to enhance labor management and administration in Jamaica. I believe the ministry must be repositioned to become a greater force and stimulant for growth and development. The International Labor Organization recently released a report titled, and I quote, What Works? Active Labor Market Policies in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it warned that achievements in recent decades in terms of social inclusion and work quality have stalled and are even beginning to reverse, leading to structural stagnation in labor markets that could, in turn, generate an increase in inequality and informality and erosion of the middle class, end of quote. The report recommended active labor market policies for improved production employment creation. And it is in this context, Mr. Speaker, that I await the preliminary recommendations of the Labor Market Reform Commission in November of this year. Mr. Speaker, the thrust for economic prosperity and job creation will find us strengthening and expanding the overseas employment programs. During the 2015-2016 fiscal year, approximately 15,000 Jamaicans were employed in the United States and Canada. This year, emphasis will be placed on strengthening, expanding, and diversifying the range of job opportunities with a goal of placing 16,000 Jamaican workers in the North American market by the end of the 2017 season. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian authorities in 2014 restricted the entry of foreign workers into certain low-skill occupations. Recent reports suggest that this situation is likely to change in the very near future as the Canadian government, in response to critical labor shortages, is contemplating relaxing some of these restrictions. Mr. Speaker, the prospects and placements in the United States are also trending upwards as this market continues to rebound. The growing demand for Jamaican workers in both the agricultural and hospitality sectors resulted in increases of 5.8% and 3% respectively in 2015. The Ministry is of the firm view that there is further scope for expansion in the United States. It is in this context that plans are afoot for me to meet with major employer groups, both in the US and Canada, in the coming weeks to promote the program and the quality of our workers with a view to securing more jobs. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we all know that Jamaican workers, wherever they are found, bring strong work ethics, discipline, productivity, and a commitment to excellence. These powerful attributes will be promoted and made available in the global marketplace. Consequently, exploratory approaches are being made in unexplored territories right here in the Caribbean and even as far away as the Australasian region and we are actively seeking to convert these prospects into avenues for employment. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security is working to advance prosperity through labor and job creation. I use this occasion to point out that the Canadian Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program is very special as it marks the 50th year of partnership between Jamaica and Canada. The program has helped to reduce unemployment, especially in rural communities. It provides income to thousands of Jamaican families, whereby many are able to own their own home and send their children to school and university. The country also benefits from remittance inflows, higher levels of savings, increased technological transfer, and an overall reduction in poverty and social inequality. Mr. Speaker, the importance of the program cannot be overemphasized as we celebrate this historic milestone and the 50 rewarding years of partnership between Jamaica and Canada. Mr. Speaker, even as we seek to tap into employment opportunities abroad, it is imperative that we improve labor market efficiency through training and certification and the development of a national employment portal and labor market information system. 
the Ministry is moving to position the Labour Market Information System as a national portal for labour market intelligence and information to guide decisions by the various stakeholders who access the service. The country's current unemployment rate, averaging over 13% in the last four years, is in part a result of skills mismatch with attendant oversupply and undersupply in certain sectors. The Ministry is working to close these gaps through the provision of germane and up-to-date labour market intelligence and career development services. Mr. Speaker, under the Inter-American Development Bank's Integrated Social Protection and Labour Project, the functional capacity of the labour market information system and the electronic labour exchange has been improved. These improvements have resulted in a 267% increase in registered employers and a matching 278% increase in job placements. It is expected that this positive trend will continue. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Labour and Social Security is advancing prosperity through the LMIS by placing special focus on the youth and members of PATH households with an on-the-job training intervention. Mr. Speaker, this program began in July 2015, and to date, 315 members of PATH families have been placed in income-earning activities. Mr. Speaker, this is prosperity in action for the most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, this afternoon I want to inform this Honourable House that I will be taking a submission to Cabinet for the mandatory use of the labour market information system to advertise all job vacancies in the public sector. Mr. Speaker, when all public bodies use the system at any point in time, the government will be able to know all vacancies that exist in the public sector. I wish to use this medium. I wish to use this medium to encourage employers in the private sector to register and use the system. And guess what, employers? The service is free of cost. Cognizant of the fact that research fuels development, the Ministry continues to conduct quantitative and qualitative research which is relevant to the labour market. The third island-wide national labour market survey will take place this fiscal year. The study will investigate employment opportunities, skill gaps, training needs and technology usage among other factors in the labour market. As Minister, I'm encouraging all employers, businesses and enterprises to participate in this survey exercise. I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, the two relevant studies tabled, employment in renewable energy, a focus on solar and wind energy, and potential areas of employment opportunities due to logistics hub development. The renewable energy study revealed that wind energy projects were being undertaken by government while solar energy usage and production was prevalent in the private sector in tourism, finance, and manufacturing. Employment opportunities were mainly found in the operational installation and maintenance stages of these projects for categories of electrical engineers, construction workers, solar panel installers, and wind turbine operators. Our logistics hub study found that job opportunities will exist for custom brokers, multi-skilled technicians, port managers, logistics clerks, mechatronics engineers, ship repairers, as well as computerized crane operators. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry is working to translate this information into transformative action to create a trained, certified and available labour pool for home and abroad. Mr. Speaker, members of this Honourable House will agree that the low growth in productivity is the root cause of low economic growth in Jamaica. As a matter of fact, Jamaica's productivity has been declining. It has been in the decline. The fundamental link between productivity, innovation, competitiveness, economic growth, and job creation is well established. 
Mr. Speaker, low growth in productivity implies low growth in gross domestic product, and low growth in gross domestic product points towards low growth in living standards. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, the strategic focus of the Jamaica Productivity Center during this fiscal year will be primarily on influencing behavioral changes through the provision of technical capacity, skills, building, and customized productivity solutions to private and public sector entities. The center believes that inculcating a productivity culture in students across the country will allow them to become efficient and effective in their learning pursuits, while at the same time spreading the productivity message. In this regard, the Be Productive and Prosper campaign in schools will be expanded. The Productivity Center will also target micro, small, and medium enterprises and provide them with productivity audits, benchmarking information, and assistance to implement recommendations. The Center will conduct island-wide training and workshops to facilitate knowledge sharing among persons in the sector. These interventions are expected to positively impact profit profitability, competitiveness, economic growth, job creation, and wage rates. Mr. Speaker, University of Princeton economics professor Paul Krugman articulated the transformational attributes of productivity very well when he stated that, and I quote, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. Therefore, every Jamaican must make it a habit to produce more goods and services from each unit of input that is at their disposal. We must develop and spread a culture of high productivity. We must set productivity standards. Mr. Speaker, we are advancing prosperity through improved productivity. I turn to worker safety and well-being. Mr. Speaker, a safe and healthy workforce is critical to productivity and prosperity. And the Ministry is committed to ensuring that the country's workers are adequately protected from potential hazards in the work environment. The recent collapse at the Royalton Hotel in Hanover and the fatal accident at the Azul Hotel construction sites underscores the urgent need for the tabling of the Occupational Safety and Health Bill in Parliament this financial year. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Occupational Safety and Health Bill will present a paradigm shift as businesses will be required to establish OSH systems, including joint safety and health committees. They will have to establish competent safety and health representatives and programs that will ensure active monitoring and management of risks in our workplaces. This framework will significantly reduce the occurrences and severity of workplace accidents throughout Jamaica. In fact, Mr. Speaker, this bill will be a game changer covering all enterprise for safety, including private homes where domestic workers are employed. Worker safety and well-being are important ingredients for wealth creation. Safe and healthy workers are the ministry's guarantee towards growth and prosperity. As we prepare for the new legislation, the ministry has been actively engaging private and public sector entities in the voluntary compliance program thereby facilitating a smooth transition to the regulatory requirements that will be binding when the new OSHA bill becomes law. Mr. Speaker, the OSHA department at the Ministry has also begun engaging academic institutions to review or revise their training programs to ensure that the training provided is relevant and in keeping with the current and new OSH bill. Mr. Speaker, our OSH department will complete the development of the National Occupational Safety and Health Policy as well as the Public Sector Occupational Safety and Health Policy this financial year. Turning to industri the industrial relations arena, Mr. Speaker, there has not been many incidences of work stoppages in any sector of the economy to date. This did not happen by chance, and it is due mainly to the dedicated work of the Industrial Relations Department in the Ministry, which ensures that disputes are settled expeditiously. The importance of the tripartite partnership 
through the Labour Advisory Council in this process must also be highlighted. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry has been receiving more individual worker complaints, that is, workers who were or who are not represented by our trade union, and we are working assiduously to have these disputes settled in a timely manner to avoid protracted downtime or any form of escalation. In 2015-2016, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry received 4,123 formal complaints through the Pay and Conditions of Employment branch of the Ministry. We are committed to capacity building and succession planning and continue to upgrade the knowledge base to meet the demands of the public. In July 2016, the Ministry, in collaboration with the ILO, will embark on a training program for 30 mediation conciliators drawn from across the Ministry. Mr. Speaker, the enactment of the Disabilities Act, the amendment of the Jury Act, and the anticipated passage of the OSH legislation during this financial year means that the Industrial Disputes Tribunal must be strengthened. The number of panels to treat with the various types of disputes will be increased, and the Ministry will expedite the expansion of the IDT outside of Kingston. I assure you and the country, Mr. Speaker, that the Ministry will continue to ensure a stable industrial environment conducive for labour and capital to facilitate economic growth for the country. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry is advancing prosperity through the protection of workers and compliance with our labour laws. Mr. Speaker, private employment agencies play a vital role in facilitating the placement of thousands of Jamaicans in viable employment opportunities. Most of them act within the provisions of the law, and an up-to-date list of compliant operators is available on the Ministry's website. But, Mr. Speaker, there are unscrupulous agencies and persons out there who take advantage of vulnerable job seekers. The Employment Agencies Unit is working to enforce the Employment Agencies Regulations Act and to apply punitive sanctions where regulations are breached. Mr. Speaker, the Employment Agencies Act is currently being reviewed to ensure that it is relevant and take into account new recruitment practices. I turn to protection of victims and labor and social security programs from human trafficking. Mr. Speaker, I note with interest and satisfaction two most recent convictions of persons for human trafficking offenses. Human trafficking is a scourge that all ministries, departments, and agencies must collectively take steps to detect, prevent, and support the prosecutorial process when called upon to do so. Let me state, Mr. Speaker, that this ministry is actively engaged in the fight against human trafficking through the steps taken to ensure that the programs and systems we monitor and regulate are not exploited by human traffickers. Victims of human trafficking oftentimes are persons who are seeking work and opportunities to advance themselves and their families in a foreign country. Since April 2016, the Ministry, with the support of the International Organization for Migration, has begun training labor inspectors, investigators, and social workers to improve their capacity to identify instances or cases of human trafficking. Mr. Speaker, in order to ensure sustainability, the Ministry is finalizing standard operating procedures to guide our labor inspectors and social workers to be able to identify victims of forced labor and sex trafficking, including children. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the International Labor Organization for the technical assistance and support being provided to enable the country to fight child labor. In 2015, workshops were held to discuss strategies and methodologies to improve data collection on child labor in Jamaica. I am pleased to report that the Statistical Institute of Jamaica is now in the field collecting data for the second National Child Labor Survey. The findings of this study, which will greatly improve our data and understanding of the status of child labor in Jamaica, will be ready by the end of this year. Mr. Speaker, Jamaica continues to say no to child labor, and in particular, its worst forms wherever it is found. This year, 
This year, we joined with the rest of the world to mark World Day Against Child Labor under the theme, End Child Labor in Supply Chains, It's Everyone's Business. The ministry on Sunday, June 26, undertook a child labor community forum in partnership with the Miracle Youth Club in Trenchtown and a business seminar in collaboration with the Jamaica Employers Federation, which will be held tomorrow, June 29th. Please allow me to reiterate once again that while Jamaican businesses may not be openly engaged in the abuse of our children's rights, I impress upon them the need to be vigilant to ensure that their supply chains and business processes are child labor free. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, child labor is unacceptable. It robs a child of their education and full development and causes physical and mental harm. It jeopardizes a child's moral well-being and their economic prospect for the future. The ministry and Jamaica will continue to combat child labor in the quest for economic prosperity. Mr. Speaker, we will advance prosperity for a Jamaica that is free of child labor. I now turn to the all-important social protection provisions under the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Social protection is undoubtedly a critical policy for transformation and national development, as it promotes human capital development and productivity. It reduces poverty, exclusion, and inequality, while enhancing growth, inclusive development, and social cohesion. As a government and a ministry, we are prioritizing the allocation of resources on social programs to ensure that it is not eroded by inflation. For financial year 2015-2016, the total allocation across government to support social spending was in the region of $27 billion. For the 2016-2017 fiscal year, the provision to support social spending has increased to approximately $29 billion. Of this amount, Mr. Speaker, the budget for the provision of safety nets through this ministry has been increased by 9% to $6.5 billion for the 2016-2017 financial year. This will go a far way in consolidating the gains we have made so far in tackling poverty and advancing prosperity through social protection. Mr. Speaker, as a country, we must have consensus on the minimum guaranteed levels of social provision for the most poor and vulnerable. A social protection floor is currently being developed through the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and we look forward to the substantive recommendations that will be sent to Cabinet by the end of the fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, we must streamline our services. We must reduce duplication and become more client-focused. This year, the Ministry will provide an integrated package of social services for approximately 2,500 families on path. To achieve greater impact, financial assistance along with more targeted and streamlined interventions to get families out of poverty will be provided. Mr. Speaker, the package of social services will increase access to housing solutions, continuing education and skills development, tertiary education, career counseling, job readiness preparation and employment opportunities, and business development training and appropriate financial assistance for viable ventures. With this enabling framework, Mr. Speaker, this government will embrace every opportunity to move poor and vulnerable families from dependence to self-reliance and sustainable livelihoods. It will take time, Mr. Speaker, Transitioning out of poverty is not a one-size-fits-all approach, but we will be persistent. We will build the resilience of poor families, and we will truly break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. Mr. Speaker, we, Mr. Speaker, we are on, on a path to prosperity through social protection. Mr. Speaker, I am concerned, and all Jamaicans should be, about the increase in non-compliance with school attendance as required under the program advancement through health and education path, 
particularly among primary school students. Mr. Speaker, at the primary level, attendance has fallen to a low of 78% for boys and 83% for girls. This means that 22% of our boys and 17% of our girls do not meet the mandatory attendance requirement of 85%. And this is not good news for the growth and prosperity agenda we are pursuing. Children must attend school. I take this opportunity to beseech parents and guardians not to obstruct or impede the lives, the life chances of their children. Please send your children to school. Children who have the opportunity to learn are eventually able to earn more and support their own families and contribute to national development. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security will be engaging the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information to address the issue of non-attendance. Specially selected PATH families with children two to six years old will attend pilot parenting workshops in Clarendon, St. James, St. Thomas, Hanover, Portland, and Kingston and St. Andrew. Some 600 families will participate over a period of nine months, and additional families will be included later. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry will be using education to create pathways out of poverty that support and prepare individuals for economic independence and prosperity. We will support our vulnerable children at every stage of the educational journey, primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry will advance job training, educational skills training, and entrepreneurship support for young people in the Steps to Work and social intervention programs as we empower the youth and prepare them for the world of work and economic independence. For the financial year 2015-2016, Mr. Speaker, a total of 556 youths were assisted under the social intervention program. In short-term employment, they worked for six months with various private and public sector companies, and they were allowed to gain valuable experience as well as earn an income. In the area of entrepreneurial assistance in 2015-2016, a total of 511 persons were approved to receive grants totaling $26.4 million to support a variety of income-generating ventures through the SIP and Steps to Work programs. For the 2016-2017 financial year, $57.5 million will be provided to assist 815 persons in this area. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry continues to be deeply indebted to those private and public sector entities who participate and collaborate with the Ministry to lift vulnerable young persons from a state of welfare into productive employment. Mr. Speaker, we are advancing prosperity through entrepreneurship. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry will continue the strategic modernization of social security services with the implementation of a document and client management system to facilitate efficient storage and tracking of client information in, and improve delivery in service response. Already, a robust beneficiary management information system is in place for PATH, Steps to Work, and the Jamaica Council for Persons with Disabilities. And these systems will be enhanced during the 2016-2017 year, while a new one is being developed for the National Insurance Scheme. Mr. Speaker, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the National Insurance Scheme. Mr. Speaker, today I salute the late Lyndon G. Newland for his vision and foresight. in creating the NIS in 1966. I remember as a child it was referred to as SIN. Today it, rep it represents the main source of social protection for many Jamaicans during retirement. In fact, during the 2015-2016 financial year, over 109,000 persons received benefits totaling over $15.4 billion dollars. As we celebrate this historic milestone, we recognize that the mandate going forward is threefold, viability, efficiency, and service. 
Let me speak about viability, Mr. Speaker. The most recent actuarial review indicates that the funds of the NIS are at risk of being exhausted by 2033 if regenerative measures are not taken now. Mr. Speaker, this is a matter that is being given serious attention. A reform committee comprised of representatives from the Ministry of Labor and Social Security and the Ministry of Finance is examining the recommendations of the actuaries, and I anticipate the first delivery of their deliberations by the third quarter of this year. Stakeholder engagement will be a part of the process as we seek to continue partnership in the pursuit of prosperity. Efficiency and service, Mr. Speaker, is important. That I acknowledge. And as Minister, the plethora of complaints being leveled about the inefficiency of the NIS, I am overwhelmed. But I assure the people of Jamaica that your concerns are noted and they will be dealt with. Activities have already commenced to modernize the operations at the NIS to include new software to significantly reduce the time for processing applications for benefits. The modular rollout of this software has already begun and should be completed within this financial year. We are also um, putting in modern payment modalities for both local and overseas-based pensioners, for, and the work has already commenced. An organizational review of the Social Security Division and other operations have been carried out in order to ensure proper alignment, greater efficiency, and a proactive NIS with its concomitant role in the growth process. The cumulative asset of the National Insurance Fund at the end of the last financial year, Mr. Speaker, was $80.6 billion, reflecting an increase of approximately $9.1 billion over the previous period. The NIF prudently invests and monitors NIS contributions for the benefit of beneficiaries. The fund is invested in several sectors of the economy and is playing a major role in the growth agenda and wealth creation. The fund is also participating in the foreign equities market and, as a prudent investment strategy, has already begun to see real returns. Total investment income amounted to approximately $11 billion and included dividend inflows of $638 million and property rental inflows of $241 million. Our latest major local project has been the refurbishment of the BRCA property at a cost of US $23 million. I'm happy to report that the refurbishment has been completed and the 232-room hotel located in Trelawney is now fully operational. The NIF will continue work on several programs, including the upgrading of parish offices across the island so that pensioners and other stakeholders can be provided with quality service. The fund will also be making changes to the rules governing loan funds that are made available through preferred financial institutions to small and medium-sized enterprises. Mr. Speaker, if we are to grow the economy, small businesses must have access to capital. We are advancing prosperity for small and medium-sized enterprises through the NIF. A new National Insurance Board has been appointed, and we thank the team led by Mr. Lennox Elvey, who has consented to serve. I use this opportunity to express my deep appreciation to the outgoing board and the former chairman under whose tenure the fund attained and maintained reasonable growth. Within the context of the prosperity agenda, the new board will be undertaking a review of all existing projects of the fund and where necessary, will reassess or reposition so that they contribute, they can contribute in a more meaningful way to economic growth and job creation. As I turn to the disability agenda, Mr. Speaker, I reiterate our commitment to inclusion, integration, and empowerment of persons for persons with disabilities and their potential for growth and development and state that this financial year there will be a special focus on these constituents. A simplified version of the 2014 Disabilities Act, both in print and braille, will to be used for public education and sensitization, will be published shortly. Mr. Speaker, it is our mission for persons with disabilities to be aware of their rights as Jamaican citizens. 
To date, 30,142 persons have been entered into our new registration system. Section 6E of the Disabilities Act mandates the Jamaica Council for Persons with Disabilities to prepare codes of practice for the avoidance of discrimination on the grounds of a person's disability. Mr. Speaker, with the support of a World Bank grant, this year we will develop two primary codes of practice, namely education and training and employment. An additional 340 persons with disabilities on the path will benefit from skills training and employment opportunities provided in collaboration with the Abilities Foundation and five other non-governmental organizations. Provision of assistive and adaptive aids will continue for children with disabilities along with increased physiotherapy and speech therapy sessions. Parents of these children will also benefit from parenting workshops to enhance their coping skills. Mr. Speaker, we have begun planning the cooperation between the Ministry and the Inter-American Network for Labor Administration, which recently selected technical officers from the JCPD and the Ministry to travel for an on-site visit to the Department of Labor in the United States for an understanding about disability legislation and enforcement in preparation for the establishment of a Disabilities Rights Tribunal. As we are aware, as we are aware, access to education is one of the major impediments faced by children with disabilities. And depending on the nature of the disability, it limits their opportunities to participate in the labor market as adults. The early stimulation program in the ministry provides early intervention services to children with disabilities zero to six years to maximize their educational potential. The construction of a new building for early assessment of children with disabilities at Hanover Street will be completed and the construction of additional classroom space at the Early Stimulation Plus Early Childhood Facility at Austin Avenue in East Kingston will begin this year. The completion of these two facilities will transform the lives of over 1,800 children with disabilities who are served by the program. Mr. Speaker, I use this opportunity to highlight the private sector's contribution to the development of the Early Stimulation Program, noting the magnanimous example of the Digicel Foundation in the construction of a center for ESP services in West Portland, the only of its kind outside of Kingston. It is the only one of its kind outside of Kingston, and I'm looking forward to the day when we will have at least one in every parish, and in this regard, we welcome new partners from private sector in this initiative. Mr. Speaker, our seniors are our most valuable asset for nation building. They are. To quote a great leader of his time, Hatma Gandhi once said, and I quote, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members, end of quote. This year, in an effort to ensure that the legal and socioeconomic framework are in place to protect and improve the quality of life for older persons, the 1997 National Policy for Senior Citizens will be revised. Mr. Speaker, residents of the Vineyard Town Golden Age Home will benefit from improved medical and wellness services with the renovation of six buildings at Cluster B to function as a medical center. This will facilitate a nursing department, doctor's office, and medical registry, examination rooms, dressing units, treatment rooms, physiotherapy unit, dental unit, and staff room for nurses. Improved levels of physiotherapy services will also be offered through the engagement of the UWI School of Physical Therapy in providing additional services to residents, while partnership has been formed with the UWI School of Dentistry to provide residents with dental services, for example, cleaning, fitting of dentures, extractions, etc. Mr. Speaker, the Golden Age Home, with its long-term vision of holistic development of the aged and the infirmed, is a crucial plank in the provision of social services, and the necessary support must be given to allow it to remain relevant. Mr. Speaker, 
Last but by no means least is a vitally important support the Ministry offers in the area of disaster relief and rehabilitation. The Ministry continues to lead the damage assessment process in times of disasters and provide well-needed short-term assistance. The Ministry will be benefiting from the World Bank's group social protection and labor global practice to carry out activities under trust fund grant to support the Government of Jamaica's social protection system for disaster preparedness and response. In concluding, Mr. Speaker, it was necessary for me to comprehensively underscore the multifaceted ways in which the Ministry of Labor and Social Security continues to impact the lives of Jamaicans and influence the process of nation building and sustainable economic development. The various separate yet interconnected initiatives and services we offer we seek to enhance, integrate, and empower Jamaicans in areas of employment, facilitation, labor market reform, education, skills training, research, and market intelligence, productivity solutions, decent work, safety and health, industrial relations stability, combating human trafficking and child labor, sustainable human capital development, pension and social provisions, and assistance and support to the most vulnerable, including the elderly and persons with disabilities. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry aims to continue this holistic mission, knowing that focused labor market policies and sustainable social security provisions for the vulnerable are important catalysts for national growth and prosperity. We continue to work with our social and, tri and tripartite partners in this mission. I have overwhelming confidence in the leadership of this administration and that as a country we will enhance and empower Jamaicans to grasp the opportunities that await us both locally and in the global economy. As Minister, I pledge my unwavering commitment and that of the Ministry of Labor and Social Security to promoting decent work and social protection and to the long-term vision of transforming Jamaica into the place of choice to live, work, raise families, do business, and even retire. Mr. Speaker, we will advance prosperity through labor and social protection.